Okay, cool. Right. So let's let's make a start. Um, so welcome everyone to our latest uh, in our series of uh, seminars on uh, Islam after colonialism. Um, and we normally have my colleague, um, Norman Nakwi, who at this point would say something about uh, what it is we've been doing so far and, and the theme uh, of our, uh, our conversations. Uh, let me just uh, say uh, that one of the questions that we raised right at the beginning um, was um, this uh, idea that uh, when we're considering this question of Islam after colonialism, we're of course interrogating what we mean by these terms and these labels, uh, but part of that process of understanding what colonialism is, what coloniality is, and of course, um, what we've talking, been talking about quite a lot, uh, decoloniality, it requires us to also understand um, the initial forms of encounter and also perhaps what happened um, before colonialism. Uh, so in that uh, vein, uh, our discussion today, I think, will take that up in particular. Um, it will discuss certain elements of um, ethics, of um, comportment, of sociability and social reality, uh, which existed before and on the cusp of colonialism and how uh, some of those ethical norms and um, ethical norm formation um, were then being explicitly juxtaposed with um, the perception of what it was that the East India Company in particular in India brought in, in terms of the way in which they engaged with the wider community. So um, uh, without uh, saying more about the general um, uh, topic, let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Manakia, who is um, uh, Associate Professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies, um, MISAS Department at uh, Columbia. Um, she is uh, the author of a recent book uh, with Stanford University Press called Persian at Selves, which came out of uh, part of a dissertation, uh, which looks at this question of place and origin uh, in the formation of uh, selfhood um, before nationalism. So, you know, ask this question of, you know, what did we what did people understand by this term Persian um, and how did it travel uh, particularly amongst, uh, between the areas of what we now understand as the modern nation state of, of Iran and other places of course, where Persia, Persian was uh, spoken, particularly North India and, and, and beyond. Um, uh, today she will be presenting a part of um, her next project, um, which, um, in particular, in particular on the uh, elements of companionship and friendship uh, with respect to this ethical formation of the self um, that we've been discussing. Um, again, with recourse to looking at some of these Persian texts which were uh, written and produced, uh, especially um, in a South Asian uh, context. So in that sense, we're continuing our, our focus on South Asia, but also significantly we're starting to see and, and hope, you know, in future perhaps when we start expanding what we're doing in the series, um, looking at how um, certain uh, South Asian case studies of Islam after colonialism help us to connect um, uh, different expressions of these phenomena in different parts of the world, particularly those which are closely connected, uh, such as this wider uh, Persian sphere or uh, Persian sphere, um, the Persian cosmopolis is sometimes also called um, that a number of people have been discussing in recent times. Um, so uh, not to delay anything further because we've already been slightly delayed. Apologies for going live slightly late. Um, I will pass over to Mana and she will have a PowerPoint. Um, um, she'll give a paper and as we usually do uh, once she's finished, um, I will uh, try to raise and ask some questions and comments. And then of course we will take any other um, comments and questions which come from those who are viewing this live on Facebook. So um, as I said, without any further delays, um, over to you, Mana, please. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, very grateful 
to Professor Sajjad Rizvi and Professor Noman Nahbi uh, for inviting me here to present today. Um, this is new work, um, so it's sort of in the process of becoming. Um, and I look forward to engagement and questions and comments. Um, so this talk um, is part of a kind of protein uh, part of a larger project about politically and socially significant forms of companionship that I argue undergirded early modern Persianate societies across Central, South, and West Asia. Uh, forms that were shared because they were interwoven with the broader circulation um, of uh, people, texts, practices, and ideas. Now, Persian polities cohered around hierarchically structured social bonds, linking individuals and groups marked by dissimilar origins, religious affiliations, social locations, occupational groupings, and claims to power. But because of the way the political grew out of the social in times of political devolution or collapse, social bonds could stabilize localities, maintain regional linkages, and provide continuity and coherence in unstable times. Um, and this is particularly important in a time like the 18th century. Um, so to realize and render these relations, these social relations legible required the enactment of particular bodily practices, as well as the production and exchange of images, compositions, books, and objects. Um, these relations of service and patronage spoken of in terms of love and friendship were hierarchical relations, bringing together the elite and less so, men and not men, as well as legal kin and those related by customary bonds alone. So beyond historicizing unhelpfully modern and obfuscating Eurocentric understandings of servitude and freedom, the individual and social difference, the understanding that many of our textual and material sources were products of bonded relations suggests new ways for us to receive and engage with them. Um, I don't know how much of this needs to be said, but by way of background from the 13th to the early 19th century, Persian was the language of power and learning across um, these regions, right? Central, South, and West Asia, used for government, philosophy, uh, at times religious instruction, historical commemoration, storytelling, poetry, um, and ethical literature. Um, and as a result of this kind of, um, as a result, a heavy and continuous circulation of people, texts, practices, and ideas connected a place that we can broadly call Persianate Asia. Um, this mobility sustained a cultural hermeneutics across those regions that could be taken up in various contexts by rulers to form imperial ideologies, um, utilized by merchants in everyday transactions, or invoked by mendicants in their peregrinations. So here I'm kind of defining Persian as a kind of person who had received a particular form of basic education that imparted something we can think of as the Persianate, uh, through which they understood and engaged with the world. Um, Persian was a textual corpus whose encapsulated meanings also lived and circulated orally in stories and in verse for broader audiences. Now, by the 18th century, the largest number of Persian speakers lived in the South Asian subcontinent, and many of them were not Muslim. Uh, Persian was a Muslim language, but it did not have to be, nor was it always so. Uh, Islam's specificity could be universalized, allowing for affiliation with and adoption into different vernaculars and religious communities. So um, that's a broad kind of background, but in what's gonna follow, I'm going to show um, the central role of sociability and social bonds, the intimacy that defined them and the interaction they engendered as constituting the very possibility of good governance. Um, and I'm gonna be kind of focusing on a text that's very important for 18th century Timurid Hindustan. So first I'm gonna situate a new reading of the Sayar al Mutaakhirin against a deeper history of Persianate and Islamic concepts and traditions around friendship and service before turning to the particular relations between men of power and men of learning. Um, okay, so part one on uh, Ghulam Hossein Taba Tabai's text. 
in what is perhaps the most widely read, cited, and referenced text on 18th century Hindustani history and politics, the Seyar al Mutaakhirin, Ghulam Hussein Taba Taboi identifies the central problem of East India Company misrule as a lack of social intimacy. Such a lack prevents their rule from being anything but a failure um, of governance and a disaster for the populace. I, I propose that this lack in what it indicates, the impossibility of just rule and a harmonious social order fundamentally sets British conquest apart from previous conquests in the subcontinent. And my purpose is to intervene in discussions around Persian eight states, apart from essentially Eurocentric discussions of the so-called early of the so-called global early modern, as well as to put pressure on the conquest narratives originally composed to justify colonial rule and now adopted by nationalists. So after elaborating, and, and this is, I'm talking about the text, after elaborating the demise of the Bengali Nawabit and the rise of the East India Company, um, Tabo Taboi explains the East India Company's structure, the ruling council, as well as that of their home country's governing body, meaning English parliament. Um, and he says, quote, they have strange regular, regulatory procedures that are extremely refined and good at the core of their administration. However, until now, for the people and governance of this region, they have been satisfied to implement the regulations and procedures of this place as whatever they have heard from functionaries and their own underlings. Uh, these they have entered into books, and it is the extent to which they know what is just and correct. And he says, Hakko Sabob. But they do this without knowing, quote, the basis according to which uh, these regulations and procedures were established. Um, after bemoaning uh, that the English are not learning these bases, Taba Tabai states, quote, in short, because the gates of companionship are closed, there is no uh, association with the people of this country by the English. The two sides are not informed of the conditions of one another. So this lack of, in, of social intercourse results in a fundamental lack of knowledge, deleterious, because it prevents them knowing what leads to the contentment of the people and the order and prosperity of the kingdom and the world. Entering incomplete and superficial information into books, which then stand in for sohbat or companionship, uh, reviewing the books in solitude, instead, um, what we might call the shift to bureaucratic rationalism, registers here as the cause of dissatisfaction and disorder. However, it is more than that. Something is missing among the English, a necessary disposition that is a prerequisite for justice. Um, and he says, quote, there is no yearning among English lords for the conversing of meetings with and listening to the stories of the common people. So we could argue that this is a matter of the English not giving proper audiences, a procedural issue. But I think that the language used is significant. It's, it's resonances with other concepts and usages in the, in the broader Persianate tradition, such as sohbat the sociability that enables transmission and reception of knowledge. Uh, these meetings engender listening to stories, hekoyot, uh, specifically those that illustrate a point requiring engagement on the listener's part, ultimately bringing, uh, in the best case, understanding and the proliferation of moral benefits. Um, the desire for this kind of intercourse is the only way for even uh, what Taba Taboi calls the wise among the naturally good-natured English to gain awareness of what will ease um, the people and achieve peace and prosperity in the domain. And these statements that, that he makes serve as the preface for Taba Taboi's description of how just rule has been dispensed by previous Persianate rulers. But I think the point is that in other words, social intercourse and the speaking and listening it engenders is the means of crucial, appropriate and beneficial knowledge. Its lack in rulership by the British is what sets them apart um, as, con as conquerors different from those that came before. Um, desire for this kind of intercourse must therefore be instilled in the new rulers marked by their alterity to Persianate Asia. 
Ennobled by their knowledge, men of letters such as Taba Tabai, defined by their lineages of service to rulers, needed to provide the continuity vital in times of transition, um, especially when the new rulers were ignorant of governance's proper forms. So a paramount concept here um, is Persianate Adab, um, which I'm defining as the proper aesthetic and ethical form of things. Um, adab was the means by which Persians could realize themselves as ethical subjects through relationships with the world enacted in their appropriate forms. Um, one primary avenue of generating this honorable self was from within relations of servitude and bondage, which in turn provided sustenance, support, protection, and beneficence. Um, however, given our own kind of modern location and its attendant assumptions about bondage and service, um, as apart from a thing called friendship, we need to kind of peel back some layers. So section two is really about um, social bonds as friendship and service between law and custom. So we identify service most often with hierarchy as a reciprocal relation of unequal power. In contrast, we associate friendship with an equality that allows it to stand apart from coercions of power and ideally from a presumed self-interest. Thus, we assume that love pervades friendship but not service uh, because power and co coercion are inimical and corrupting. For love and friendship to be true, uh, therefore, they must be disinterested from realms of power. Um, more recent scholarship actually has shown us two important things, that friendship was publicly significant and that it was formal. Nevertheless, even the most robust scholarship on friendship, which usually focuses on European contexts, understands friendship as an informal type of relationship, however significant to the workings of power and politics it might be. This insistence on its informality, even in the wake of Alan Bray's pathbreaking book, leaves untouched our modern assumptions about the undesirability of informal workings in the public sphere. Um, so informality here signals a lack of regulation, systematization, predictability, and by extension, rationality and justice. But the distinguishing markers of what makes something formal or not um, are measured as only, only as legal or bureaucratic structures um, in the study of earlier periods, which is a bit of a problem. Um, indeed, following Alan Bray, valuable work has, has recently been done by Emma Flatt and Daoud Ali, showing us that unlike England, um, the instrumental, instrumental, instrumentality and expectations of mutual cooperation need not be masked. So um, Emma Flat focuses on uh, Persianate Bahmani, Bahmani and uh, Central Asian Timurid contexts um, and shows that, quote, friends were expected to help each other actively in the pursuit of education, mercantile opportunities, employment, patronage, um, largely by means of advice, preferment, recommendations, introductions, and contacts. Um, formal friendships were serious life commitments. They functioned politically as relations both of loyalty and of intimacy, reflecting an ideal of companionship in the context of service, according to which one's social self took form. Um, this was a form of sociability inaugurated by various ritual acts, including sharing a meal and other forms of material and commemorative exchange and acknowledgement. Um, which had symbolic political meaning, but which could also be and was, act and was actualized with real consequences. Um, in more than one tradition, devotion to a superior, even to God, was spoken of in terms of friendship. Moreover, um, and here I'm quoting Emma Flatt, quote, rather than an exclusive private relationship, therefore friendship was an open act, a demonstration to contemporaries as much as to oneself of the extent to which one was embedded within a web of allegiances, alliances, and supporters. Um, in other words, social bonds linked people together, but in polyadic networks that required enactment of proper aesthetic and ethical forms, adab, uh, and negotiation of the obligations of different relationships. So bonds with a superior, whether teacher, commander, overlord, king, um, or Sufi teacher, guide, 
uh, focused, uh, fostered more horizontal solidarities, right? Um, furthermore, they created the potential for hierarchical and horizontal linkages between individuals over lines of difference. Um, and I think significantly, rather than existing in spite of hierarchy, uh, Dawud Ali uh, describes um, affection and camaraderie that did not simply traverse, quote, the bonds of a hierarchical service relationship, but happily inhabited this structure. So thus, unlike European context, the facade of disinterest was not necessary or understood as inimical to expressions of intimacy and affection. And this brings us back to the Timurids and Muniz Farouqi's recent arguments about the centrality of princely households as a kind of royal training ground um, and political base um, and their role in the forging of empire-wide networks of friends and allies to integrate disparate groups and localities into the imperial system. He mentions, um, one of the things he mentions are festive and commemorative occasions as the basis of establishing and maintaining such relationships, but little else about why social bonds at the level of the household and beyond were so politically instrumental. Um, in another context, Asif Ashraf has shown that these political practices uh, were part of early Qajar state formation uh, quote, reflected and reflected a culture of exchange that existed within broader 19th century Iranian society and enmeshed the elite in social and economic relations that helped sustain their rule. Therefore, when the state frayed or fell, society could still hold together, weathering considerable disruptions. Um, so, however disparate they seem in terms of political location, power, and intimacy, um, I want to argue that friendship and service are on a continuum with one another and with a whole host of other relationships. Indeed, the meanings of friendship could overlay and characterize a variety of relations that we consider other. They certainly were distinct, but friendships, expressions of love and practices of intimacy shaped their forms of exchange um, and of obligation and rights. Um, so I'm gonna um, convey a sense of the continuum of relationships very quickly with images. I'm not gonna have time to analyze them, but I wanna kind of um, use some images um, of relationships, significant others that we're much more used to uh, understanding as such and link it to different kinds of relationships. So these are lovers. Um, this is another kind, these are other kinds of lovers. Um, and, uh, and these are sort of Safavid images, right? But here is um, another pair and, and the fact that all of these have the wine cup and jug sort of signals that, but this is the youth and the dervish um, in conversation. Um, now we also have kind of um, companionship in the context of formal scenes of learning, right? Um, and aside from learning, and I want you to kind of see all the books and the, the writing and the discussion, um, but these are, these are not totally far away from other um, scenes of conviviality um, across traditions. Um, and I wanna kind of um, show you, right, that even in these more famous, uh, this is actually from the cover of my book, but even in the kind of more famous um, meetings between princes, which are shown as kind of, you know, um, one hosting the other in a social gathering, there is always an audience of onlookers, um, a kind of entourage, right? And, and this is important because it's not just a relationship between two people necessarily. Um, you know, these are, these are some of the more famous uh, Timurid uh, images, right? This is very famous. Um, and, and this is an instance where this is a friendship only in painting, right? And the painting enacts the meeting that the bodies could not. Um, but they were not only, friendships were not just commemorated and enjoyed by the high, they also included more modest sorts of people. Um, so we have images of companions working together. Um, and these are um, early, um, late 16th, early 17th century images. It's a series of colophon paintings. Um, and this is a colophon painting from a Khamsa of Nezami. Um, and it's 
it's meant to kind of be the painter and the scribe who worked on the text. Um, and here's a close up of it. Um, So we want to remember that you know they're they're sort of I, mean, I think what's significant significant about this is that they're both working on a text, but there's also a book at the center of the painting. Um, and this is another um, image of calligraphers working on Achlor um, Nasseri, which is an important ethical text. Um, but let's go back to my opening picture of the audience hall of the Nawab of Bengal as imagined in hindsight around the time that Taba Taboyi was writing. So differences of status and stature within social bonds made it so that these relations were marked by particular obligations and privileges. Um, however, um, these relations of service were understood within the framework of amity, of friendship, companionship, and alliance. And the most common terms are dusti, sohbat, and the very specifically political refaqat. Um, to understand Persianate and political, social, uh, uh, political and social ethics, their forms and practices, we need to dispense with assumptions that valorize equality and linked them with stark distinctions between free and unfree around which so much European thought revolves. Um, if we consider the fundamental nature of social bonds more broadly on a continuum with what we have been given to call slavery, uh, but which I propose we call bondage, we can understand how ideal forms of Persianate societies, their hierarchies of power, were predicated on bonds that provided the connective tissue um, of governance. The obligations of those who were legally owned was not vastly different from those that we call free. And in fact, to be free of bonds that embedded one socially was to be abject regardless of jural status. Um, so instead of looking for state institutions, um, often envisioned remarkably like Weber's impersonal modern uh, bureaucratic model, which we know was hyper real even for Europe, um, let us look at the customary practices that guided the significant forms of relations between people. Um, and and, and th it was these practices and their specific enactments that made up the bedrock of Persianate societies and polities. Um, but before speaking about sociability and its adab, uh, let me explain what I mean by formal in a customary sense. Um, that's anything that is widely understood to have a particular form. Um, as moderns, it's very easy for us to limit the arena of the formal into what is enshrined in law or documented in administrative practice. Um, the idea is that formal structures of this nature supposedly have a real and or significant ramification for human lives. Thus, when looking for the political, we usually look to the law, its contraction, promulgation, violation, invocation, or application. We assume that something enshrined in law leads to particular outcomes, though we know that laws were unevenly implied and enforced. Um, historically, there was a similar variance of consequences that came with the violation of formally customary relationships. So if you betrayed the bread and salt of the king, the results could be death, exile, or different types of forbearance or forgiveness generative of other political outcomes. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about sociability as a sign. Um, so recent work has explored various features of both the Sayyad and its authors specifics, as well as the larger trends of which they were indicative. Um, these include the rise in the stature of the Munshi and his role as historian, as well as the trajectory whereby men of letters uh, left imperial service entered the service of regional rulers, and then finally towards the end of the century were employed by the East India Company as servants. The siyar then is both a sign of its times and firmly ensconced in early modern Persianate traditions of historical commemoration. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, sort of this tradition, which I think is very important. Um, so 
there is a kind of way, right? Um, any number of normative texts, which were the staple of a Persianate education, outlined man's essential nature as fellowship. Such intercourse generated love and its necessary alternative, justice. Um, and here um, we can think about the Akhlaq al-Nasari, which explains that, quote, natural fellowship is one of the properties of men. And in so much as the perfection of anything lies in the manifestation of its property, so the perfection of man too lies in the manifestation of this property to its, its own kind. This property, moreover, is the principle of love, muhabbat, calling forth urbanity or tamaddun, um, and social synthesis. So he goes on to elaborate how Islam attends to this practice of perfection through congregational prayers, pilgrimage, and other communal uh, practices. Tusi then adds that, quote, men have been urged to combine in both devotions and convivial gatherings, for in society, the above mentioned fellowship comes from potency into act. For Tusi then, sociability creates the fellowship that actualizes the possibility of perfection in man. So social bonds were properly enacted according to relational principles. Thus the first defining feature of the ruler in the virtuous government that Tusi outlines is that quote, he holds fast to justice, treating his subjects as friends, filling the city with widespread goods, which consist of security, tranquility, mutual affection, justice, continence, graciousness, and loyalty. Tusi identifies the kind of love that a ruler should have towards a subject as, quote, a paternal love, while that of the subject for the ruler should be filial. The love of subjects for each other should be fraternal so that the conditions of order may be preserved among them. So I think that this familial language is very important because it transacted meaning between the realms of social and political bonds. Um, and I'm going to kind of go on to talk about that in a minute, um, but I think it's also important to note that there are similarities between the forms of exchange expected from servants and from friends. Um, and Jürgen Paul is noted in 12th century Seljuk context that, quote, a standard element in letters addressed to the king or other high-ranking persons with whom the writer has concluded a bond of khidma or khidmat uh, is to express one's longing for the presence of the superior or the Lord. This feeling is called eshtiyak and it must be voiced in such letters. Eshtiyak is a word that means yearning or desire and quote, arza eshtiyak o muhabbat or the offerings uh, or the kind of request of uh, yearning and affection for the addressee of the letter was a standard part of letters amongst those we would more easily classify as friends. Um, and Emma Flatt notices the same expressions in friendship letters um, in, the, in the Bahmani context, um, such as between Mahmoud Gawan, uh, the Bahmani vizier, and, and, and uh, Abdel Rahman uh, Jami, uh, the, the renowned Timurid man of letters. But in this case, who is the higher ranked person? Gawam and uh, Jami were part of a kind of mutually sustaining trans-regional network of men of learning and power dissimilar in stature and basis of authority, but symbiotically dependent on one another. Um, so in medieval South Asian, here, in medieval uh, Islamic South Asian context, the concept of service can be divided into nokari, bandagi, um, which morphed into khidmat by the 16th century as Sunil Kumar has elaborated. Um, the terms are defined by different social statuses. A nokar possessed prominent lineages and skills indicative of high standing that the bande, slave or not, lacked. However, he notes the interpermeability of these respective positions with bande khas acting as a sort of intermediary category. Furthermore, numerous individuals could and did cross the line between bande and nokar though their educational accomplishments and accumulation, uh, through their educational accomplishments and accumulation of social bonds that built sturdy networks. Um, he seeks to locate jural relations, noting that a host of factors prevents us from understanding ownership as de facto disempowerment or abjection, and that status was relational, 
um, as the questions of whose slave slash servant, for example, could throw up an individual status for debate. Um, so I would, I would add that um, uh, these notions aren't limited to public service, as he calls it, but they really very much emerge out of broader social relations and embeddedness from which they gain their traction. So for instance, khedmat can also describe a student's relationship with a teacher, as can the term sohbat, uh, which is a word that means companionship or conversation. Um, khedmat in the political context was one where, quote, if retainers exert themselves correctly, they earn rights, um, or recognize claims, uh, which the ruler has to take into account. The ruler offers benefits, um, and the retainer offers fidelity, um, exchanges facilitated by forms of companionship. So the bond of service took the household and thus kinship as a model, um, included the household included households within it and extended these reciprocal bonds outward to others. Um, but let's not call this Weberian patrimonialism or a mere reflection of Gramscian hegemonic culture driven by the self-interests of elite social networks, which are the two poles by which the state is analyzed, um, but which are hopelessly Euro Eurocentric and very modern. Um, so European and modern concepts, however, plague even studies of pre-modern and non-European forms of governance. So in his um, study of the Seljuks, Jürgen Paul is only able to call these others vassals or rhetorical members of the household in contrast to those who are putatively real. Um, and that really kind of indicates a ground. And that ground is the distinction that's made according to legal status. While in the sources, all are part of khidma relationships. So my point isn't that legal status was a negligible distinction, but we cannot take it as definitive of what was real. Um, and treating it as such interrupts a continuum determined um, by customary regulation that is far more significant. Uh, the language of kinship extended the force of injunction to customary relationships. Um, so Paul tells us, for instance, that supposedly free servants were spoken of as if they were slaves or alternately in terms of kinship. So it should be obvious by now that we are awash in polysemous terms between friends and servants, servants and slaves, all of them with family. So Tal al-Assad notes that no Quranic term corresponds precisely to the English kinship, and that words for family can mean both common natal lineage and, and those who share a household. The polysemy of these terms underlines intimacy as the basis for words that can mean wife, brother, relative, or companion, friend, close friend. Not all of the terms Assad discusses are common in Persian, but the same policy me appears among terms that refer to both legally regulated relationships and to those dependent on social recognition alone. For Assad, the simultaneity of meanings linking family bonds to other intimate social bonds raises the question of how so-called primary meanings are to be determined. In other words, why must we assume that one is necessarily derivative of the other rather than co-constitutive? Um, so one of the th examples I give is that service um, was um, often discussed as sirret, uh, meaning form, shape, or mold, but in Islamic law, uh, the proper way to offer a contract, um, and in Persian also used to name temporary marriage. Um, kinship therefore has to be kind of understood as a variety of forms um, and, uh, in, and these forms are kind of bound by adab. So the law may define for us um, our milk siblings and prescribe uh, inheritance and marriage relations, but adab signified what a sibling relationship should be, ideally one based on intimacy, trust, protection and generosity, whose absence had to be accounted for when ideals were precluded. Um, so I'm gonna kind of skip ahead because I don't wanna take up too much time, but I wanna think about what some of the things I've talked about 
uh, means about the ethical and aesthetic forms of companionship, um, let us say, adab musahibat, and why they were so instrumental to the presence of just rule and social harmony for a man of letters embedded in political service, such as Ghulam Hussein Taba Tabai. Um, and I'm gonna look specifically at the relationship between men of learning and men of power. Um, and I'm gonna be looking at, um, I, I sort of frame this as um, these are kind of, this is a social form of exchange that produce connection, symbiosis and intimacy between people that are usually considered uh, umara uh, with the title of Han um, and men of learning or fozala. Um, and these were people with kind of different sources of authority. Uh, but I think it's important to note, as Emma Flatt has, that men of learning, such as scholars, jurists, and literati, were required for a court's own understanding of itself as a valid entity. Um, men of power needed men of learning, and these relations were as vital um, to uh, pre-modern states as those between rulers and military subordinates. So Khan Fazil relationships were symbiotic. Um, they were inflected with aspects of teacher student and patron client relationships. Um, and they showed their respective care and gratitude as intimacy in the language of kinship, love and friendship. Um, and obviously variations existed, particularly um, with differences in age or status, uh, but the invocations of love and friendship lent these service relations a kind of parody. Um, and I'm gonna give you uh, an example. Um, so there are several attributions for this painting, but this is thought to be Aga Mirake Tabrizi, uh, the painter and calligrapher, uh, and Shah Tahmas. And, and you can see again, the book is at the center of the painting. Um, and it's particularly a safine. Um, so the model of companionship between the Fazil and Khan was both widespread and with precedent. Um, and many learned persons who appear in Tasketas as master poets are biographically depict depicted in terms of their student patrons. So by the end of the 18th century, uh, Khalil ibn Aresi could say of Farid al-Dehlavi that quote, he spent a long while cherished and respected in the companionship of nobles before he chose to don the clothes of a darvish at the end of his life. Um, and this meant that he, quote, lived without worldly attachments or appointments, but he did not live without the agitations of love and the burning fire of companionship. Um, so at the end of his life, as in the middle, someone like Farid could bestow benefits, Fava'id, through companionship with powerful men who are at once students and patrons. And mirroring their learned companions, the life trajectories of accomplished umara take the shape of a list of companion teachers that along with their origins defines them. So the ideal manifestation of this companionship is summed up in Khali's description of the elder uh, Esal Khan, um, a late a mid 18th century Timurid office holder. So um, after noting his, I think it's here, oh no, after noting his uh, serious disposition, his excellent progress in some of the usual sciences, his acquaintance with music, his precise poetry, perceptive mind, his ability to compose prose well in both Persian and Arabic, Khalil finishes this list by noting his distinction, quote, in the sphere of sincere attachments. Esa Khan was someone who fostered companions, and nurtured men of excellence. He was a great patron of learned men, though significantly Khalil uses descriptive terms of solicitous friendship. One of Esa Khan's primary beneficiaries, the scholar Hana Arazu declares that, quote, during 20 some years in his service, this poor Arazu was true in his sincere attachment and devoted bondage. For this reason, he observed the most perfect kindness towards Arasu. So I, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, and I go through in the longer paper, a number of other relationships, um, such as between Farid de Dehlavi um, and Vale d'Aghestani. And I, um, we're, there is a kind of similar language um, 
there, but I think the thing that is uh, quite important to remember um, is that um, Fakir, in these relationships, services are rendered, right? Compositions are made and texts are produced. So for instance, Farid collects Valé's divan and he sets to verse the story of his unrequited love for his cousin, right? Um, and a, a certain kind of reciprocal um, set of texts are produced in, in these um, contexts. And um, this is, uh, and, and the relationship between them appears to frame the story of Valé's love. Um, and it is not unlike a number of other well-known texts where the relationship with the friend frames the text and creates its possibility. Um, and this is a, one of the many copies that we have um, of Masnavi of Valé Sultan, um, which Fagri wrote for his friend, right? And, and really the kind of point is um, that Fakir's gift of the divan and the masnavi were an articulation of gratitude to his powerful friend's care and reverence. Now, by in conclusion, I just wanna kind of bring us to a, a, a particular point, right? That material exchanges made social bonds without which they would not have been recognized or maintained. Um, the fulfillment of obligations of care and gratitude were made in the form of exchanges that, that created and circulated texts as objects, compositions, and expressions. But what does this generative context mean for how we are to receive and engage with them? Um, and if we take the Sayyad as an example, this text is identified and read as a chronicle. Um, and renowned amongst its features is that it's been called the first critique of colonialism, penned in the 1780s. This reading is a little bit complicated by the fact that the text is dedicated to the infamous governor general, Warren Hastings. Um, and it was written while Taba Taboi was both employed by the East India Company and also in danger of losing his family property in the web of debt and taxation resulting from the first couple decades of their rule. Thus, given that Taba Taboi wrote this text as a man of letters who enjoyed companionship and patronage from several high-ranking company members, including Hastings himself, what are we supposed to do with this? Um, the text, in a certain sense, is a gift, though not one without the bitter pill of instruction, as someone like Saadi would put it, um, to new and somewhat ignorant rulers. Um, this tradition of instructing rulers through both praise and exhortation via exempla and poetry was a long tradition going back almost as long as Persian men of letters had existed. So how shall we receive Taba Taboi's gift, this warning, this means of instruction? Um, and I think that there has to be a kind of moment in which we take seriously the kind of frame and conditions of becoming of the text in our ways of reading it which opens it to a different kind of relationship between us and the text. Um, and so we might think of it as a gift and think about, we might receive it as a gift, examine its spirit um, because texts were not dead letters. Um, they were things that actualized meaning in the world. Um, and with Taba Taba Sayar, we might take we might need to take social intimacy as political ethics seriously and think about what analysis of the state, the meaning of politics and narratives of conquest might look like if we do. Um, and I think that it might give us a view of a different kind of human, right? Of homo amicus, which was the desiring subject of adab and its justice, rather than assume and read for the now de facto trans historical homo economicus who did everything according to a very modern, capitalistic, rational self-interest. In Persianate terms, men with power in the world made it possible for men of learning to produce and propagate knowledge, uh, which they received for themselves and all the others to whom they were connected. Um, the enactment and thus realization of this relation produced texts. They were words and deeds that brought virtue to the world. Um, so perhaps, um, Perhaps the only way to think of the relations of service and friendship, of politics and society, 
outside the continuing strictures of Eurocentrism is to take them seriously as gifts of intimacy with their circulatory spirit of moral and material exchanges, as Marcel Mauss puts it. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Mana. Um, really fascinating piece, uh, not least because I think it, it actually suggests lots of interesting ways in which we can rethink politics uh, in particular. And, uh, and also this strikes me as being a good example of um, uh, a way of looking at coloniality or, or um, a critique of, of coloniality, which, um, you know, to use a very traditional motif is, is pitched as a conflict between eros and nomos, right? So eros being sociability, friendship, uh, love, nomos as this kind of idea of, of rational administration of order uh, of um, legal structures and so forth. Um, and that, uh, you know, that could be quite an interesting kind of way of, of dealing with that because of course, as I said, you know, Eros versus Nomos is such an old kind of trope, which is used in um, in Persian literature and certainly in Sufi literature uh, to to represent two kind of different ways of you know organizing society or organizing sets of, of social relationships. Um, uh, there are a kind of a number of, of things which um, struck me. I um, I'm, I'm going to probably just ask you two or three small things and then see if there are any questions which come in and, and take it up. Um, I guess um, one of them is whether you think there, um, what sort of legacies did this kind of model of sociability have in the slightly later period? So, you know, once um, empire is a bit more established, um, in India, in, in Hindustan, and in, in North India in particular. Um, do you see um, remnants of this? I mean, I can, I can kind of think of echoes, particularly in the, the circle of someone like Ghalib in Delhi in the, in the mid kind of 19th century, a lot of the similar kind of language of love, of, of service, um, talking about the Musahibat of the Shah, um, uh, the, the, the Mughal ruler, of course, who, at this point really didn't have any power whatsoever. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and also I think to a certain extent, um, when you look at these sort of norms, Ghalib is also a good example because of the way in which he feels slighted in his um, relationship with Delhi College. So, you know, he's offered this, this position and he feels that he is not treated in the proper manner um, because there isn't that proper kind of social exchange which he expects. Um, uh, and of course, Delhi College as this kind of hybrid English new institution is supposed to be um, ushering a new different way, a different way of organizing institutions, um, which are much more based on, uh, I guess, the formal structures of a university. Um, so there's, there's, I guess, a, a set of questions which might arise up about, you know, what happens afterwards, what happens uh, to these sort of norms of sociability and, and love and friendship once um, the colonial state and its structures and institutions are, are much more established um, um, about 50 odd years later. Um, another uh, a point um, which again kind of came back to me is that it's, it's also quite tempting perhaps to, uh, to project some of our um, modern kind of um, binaries onto this sort of material. So one obvious binary is the idea of, um, you know, the liberal autonomous self and the rights and the, um, the freedoms of the liberal autonomous self in society, um, which is considered to be um, a, a expression of modernity, as opposed to this notion of um, uh, friendship, mutuality, um, communitarianism, as it's sometimes called, which is considered to be a feature of more traditional uh, societies. And, and I wonder whether um, we can actually use some of this material to maybe undercut that, because what is very obvious to me and anyone who looks at the way in which politics is actually practiced 
in the world, even today. Sociability is at the center of it. You know, for example, in, in England, we well, in Britain, we talk about the old boys network, right? We talk about notions of the establishment. Now, how does the establishment and the mutuality work within that political system? It is through forms of sociability. It's through forms of kind of acculturation through having gone to the same school, being a member of the same club, you know, uh, obvious exchanges, gifts, uh, which are uh, in that. And, and of course, um, if you perhaps talk about that more openly, it sounds like you're talking about corruption, um, but that's actually just the state of the way in which politics works. Um, so you've got a, an official veneer of, um, you know, the separation of powers and elections and legislation and so forth. But of course, everyone knows that if you want to actually get anything done politically, you can't do it without the ties of sociability. Um, and, and the sort of the basic problem of a double standard where um, it's kind of hidden within various Western liberal democracies. But when it's very clear in somewhere else, like India, like Pakistan, like Iran, it's immediately labeled as corrupt practice. Right? So how, how do we kind of really think through um, those sorts of, of bonds? And I think um, the, uh, perhaps the, the third uh, question I have, um, which is a bit more exploratory, um, is while a lot of what you've said, you know, clearly is coming out of the Akhlaq tradition, is clearly coming out of the, you know, the, the reception of Saudi also in, in Hindustan, uh, has, resonances of Aristotle as well. But I'm wondering if uh, Tawa Tawai, um, and maybe those who, his interlocutors perhaps, um, were at all talking about other kinds of Indic notions of um, the way in which justice is exercised and friendship and love work within that. So is there any reference to like the Arthashastra kind of tradition of writing or other kind of Indic forms um, of um, genres of writing which talk about um, political association, friendship um, in that context. So, sorry, there's quite a lot of things there <laughs> which I'm just throwing at you, but um, um, uh, really fascinating. Yeah, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, to take your last question first, um, I mean, I think I, I always have a problem with this notion of Indic because it's like um, the scholarship really spends a lot of time, um, scholarship on Mughal kind of forms of knowing spends a lot of time talking about how ideas of the Indic are translated in, into um, uh, Persian and received and all of this. Um, and, and part of my issue with that scholarship is that it takes India as a special case, right? As if the, the, the because there's a majority of non-Muslims under Muslim rule that they out of practicality had to accommodate the traditions of these people um, as if no other Muslim ruler <laughs> before the Mughals ruled over a majority <laughs> non-Muslim non population. Uh, which we know is not true, um, and uh, as if uh, you know, Islamic traditions have never uh, engaged with and incorporated um, the traditions of other um, forms of knowledge. And right, so I mean, this is very problematic. Um, I do think some of this literature has shown us really valuable ways um, that this happens, and I think it's part of a longer tradition in Persian. And one of the kind of most interesting iterations of it for me, um, which I think is directly relevant for understanding what happens in India is uh, under the Ilkhanids, right? Where you have these kind of Persian men of letters encountering and incorporating not just uh, the Mongols themselves, right? Uh, and their lineage and history, and, but, but also the people that the Mongols bring them into contact with. Right, so discussions about Buddhism and the reception and engagement with Chinese thought um, and things like that. But I think that by the time Taba Taboi is writing, and this is really kind of, it's the end of the 18th century, 
right? And it's not that the Persianate dies at that point, but it does undergo profound transformations. Um, and, you know, by the time you get to Qaleb, um, you know, he's dealing with institutions and a kind of rising uh, dominant set of forms and understandings that are very much changing and eroding the Persianate concepts as a kind of overarching determinant, right? I mean, I think that aspects of it certainly continue, um, but also when Taba Taba is talking, it's also a very kind of uh, mature moment in the encounter with things we can call Indic. Um, so it kind of goes back to the question of um, in the Akhlaqi tradition, are we reading Aristotelian thought? Are we reading Greek thought or are we reading Islamic thought? because it's been so integrated um, and, and kind of harmonized. And, um, you know, and the way that this seems to happen um, based on what I've read and also the scholarship around these different moments is that um, a kind of moment of mutual resonance is taken up um, and translated back and forth sometimes, right? Um, but by this point, I don't know how much of it is necessarily understood as Indic in the tradition itself. Right. So, um, you know, when the Mughals, for instance, start to enact Darshan, um, I mean, by the end of the 18th century, I don't know how much of like that this is marked as the practice of Hindu kings. Does that make sense? So, so I think they're definitely in there. Um, and there we do have scholarship also about the ways in which it it travels in the other direction. Um, but at this point, there's been a lot of transaction back and forth. And you know, one of the um, things that I, I didn't get to put in this paper, and I don't think there'll be room for it in this paper, um, but one of the heroes of Taba Tabai's text, there are two main heroes. One is Ali Vadi Khan, and the other is Shetab Rai mm. as a munshi. I mean, this, is a, this man is like the consummate kind of ethical subject, and he's not Muslim. Um, so I, I, I think that that's, that, that would be the answer I give. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would have to kind of go back and see if he's actually pinging things as Indic, but in general, thinking of him and the people who are writing in and around his time, and, and especially being able to see kind of moments where people that are coming from other places encounter stuff and it seems weird to them. Um, for these writers, it's, it's very much a part of it. And, when you do have the encounter from writers that are coming from West or Central Asia, um, it, it's kind of understood that this is something that the people here do, um, but it's not necessarily marked as Hindu, right? It's, it, it's also very much generally understood as just a local variation. And, and those people um, you know, it, will um, agree with it and, and respond to it with different levels of comfort. Um, but by no means uh, exclusively uh, apart from it. Um, as for as for your second point, um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, right, this this idea of uh, the impersonal, and I think that the key is not informal; it's impersonal. Right, the idea is bureaucracy and institutions are impersonal, and therefore they are not subject to um, ab abuse and corruption and, and bribery <laughs> and these sorts of things. And this has a very specific history. And the kinds of obfuscation that you point to um, are very much part of a kind of colonial relationship, right? And we know this from Orientalism and things like that. Um, and, and this may seem like a super banal point. Um, and a lot of times when I'm <laughs> working on stuff, I will sometimes have people tell me, well, that's obvious, Mana. Um, but then I say, but actually it's still being played out in the scholarship. And so it may be obvious, but nobody knows how to actually do it otherwise, right? And so for me, um, the issue is the, the labor of obfuscation of this kind of um, the role of sociability and the relationship between the social and the political in the context of Europe which we know exists, right? Um, this, was, this was enabled, this obfuscation was enabled in part by the marking 
of the Orient as a kind of site of despotic corruption, right? Um, and so the, the result has been a kind of um, response to that, right? And so in, in some ways, um, calling what you see in South Asia and in other places, um, calling it patrimonialism seems almost a kindness, um, right? When the alternative is Oriental despotism. Um, but at the same time, um, this doesn't allow us to get out from under the presumed ideal of a impersonal um, kind of uh, politics, right? And, and the way in which this has driven scholarship to look for largely bureaucratic and administrative structures. And for me, the epitome of it is the um, uh, very kind of impoverishing translation of Ayn as institution. Right, and, and in, instead of kind of taking that term and putting it in a semantic field um, of rasm and adab and adat and, and the, the kinds of things um, and the meanings and significances that those terms signal and how they work um, in, in, um, in these texts and, and how certain things are quite um, either harmonious um, or when you speak, for instance, of the um, clash between Eros and Nomos, right? Um, the ideal is that these can be harmonized, right? And so they can be less of a clash and more of a negotiation, yeah. right? And that, and that is, that is the, it, it's not the, the dominance of one over the other that's the, the desired outcome, right? Um, and so, so that, I mean, and I also think that um, selves, and this is what I argued in my um, first book, right? Selves come out of collectives. Um, they um, become articulated in that sense. So it's not really about saying, well, there's no individuals, <laughs> right? And that we have to dispense with that because it's, you know, horribly contaminated by liberalism. Um, the idea is that you, you did have selves, but they were of a different nature. And if we're ever going to hope uh, to sort of get at what it looks like and what it means, um, we have to, to start with a different epistemology that doesn't require uh, one or the other um, and, and, and think about how they may be connected. Um, and and to, to your other point about the legacy, um, I think that I think that it there I, I sort of have a problem with um, the dominance of a certain kind of colonial epistemology. Um, I think is a very kind of slow, long, incomplete process. Um, and I think that it's not fully complete even now. Um, but I do think that um, some of the ways and the tools that we have to look back um, on the continuation and endurance of these older ideas um, require kind of stepping away from um, things like periodization, modernity, the colonial period. Um, and and it, they sort of continue now um, the, because because you have um, because you have a kind of continuing, for instance, of spaces like princely states in India, and you also have the way in which these sorts of ideas lived in society more broadly, um, these things did continue. Um, I, I do think that the nation state has actually been quite complicit in furthering the, the, the kind of project of um, kind of suppressing these forms of being um, by demanding the kind of uh, strict limitations and divisions um, that that characterize it. Um, but I but I think that I mean it's not it's not just about elites. We can also think about certain kinds of practices um, that continue in the subcontinent and in other places, right? Um, both of adoption, but also of um, uh, other forms of sociability that maybe are divorced from the state. And we can think about 
communities that are around particular shrines and places like this, right? Um, I don't know, that's not really sort of where I go into, but in, in looking at the um, language that continues in the 19th century, at least, uh, even in the debates around reform, right? Around which so much ink has been spilled as the hallmark of the 19th century because it kind of anticipates modernity that comes later. Um, when you actually look at a lot of that literature, it's very much depending on these older concepts in order to refigure and make a case for something we can call reform, right? Um, and so it's part of a kind of older tradition of how we bring newness into the world, right? We um, depend on and use the authority of older ideas in order to um, introduce something new. Um, and I find that many of the, the kind of modernist writers um, very much use this language and very few of them, I mean, there are people that are like that, uh, but very few of them say, we didn't have this before at all. And we need to just take, you know, uh, what is new and modern wholesale. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a good answer. No, thank you. I mean, that, I think that that's useful. Um, uh, I mean, certainly the, those, the question of, um, you know, these sort of resonances and how they continue and how they continue in different forms, perhaps alongside the more bureaucratic so-called rational, administrative, and so forth. I think that's in some ways quite interesting how they 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 continue side by side. Um, and, and as I said, you know that's that's true of um, you know parts of Asia, and it's definitely true of, of parts of the West as well. Um, we we have a couple of comments which actually have come in from Norman, and one is uh, kind of a deliberate. Um, well, devil's advocate because he says himself that he he doesn't really agree with this, but. It is often said, um, you know, when you were talking about this issue of, of hierarchy and sociability and, um, you know, bonds of service, um, one of the obvious um, pushbacks that someone could have is, well, aren't you to a certain extent romanticizing these sorts of relationships? Um, you know, I mean, these relationships can quite easily be very abusive um, and highly problematical as well. Um, so, um, you know, how do you, I guess, how does one retain that sort of um, social ethic without necessarily romanticizing it and, and fixing it as, you know, the ultimate way of understanding the world um, or, you know, the only way perhaps of understanding the world? Um, no, I mean, I think that's a good point. And I actually kind of took it out of the talk um, a little bit. I mean, listen, one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that we're writing in a particular context, right? So we are writing in a context of nation states and national cultures and all sorts of assumptions. Um, and my, I guess this is, I kind of brought this up when I talked about sibling relationships, right? Um, so the ideal helps us um, understand what's at stake um, and what needs to be accounted for in moments of transgression, right? So we know that not every sibling relationship um, was a great one, right? And, and uh, occasionally it was quite bad. Um, and especially when you get into situations where amongst the elite, right? Amongst the political elite, your relationship with your siblings could be in fact quite fraught um, because of questions of inheritance and succession and things like this. Right. But nevertheless, um, for instance, I mean, just to even take a Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb never quite got out from under the stain of having uh, imprisoned his father and killed his brothers. Right. And, and so there is a kind of set if if one knows what the ideal of social ethics is, it becomes a much easier uh, to to read and understand um, what's at stake in presenting things in a particular way or accounting for its absence, right? Because uh, there are many, many kinds of acrobatics that, that get formulated around the absence or lack of what is supposed to be there, 
And, and if we are reading, you know, I mean, it, for me, it always comes back to reading. Um, we want to read chronicles, like there's some sort of documentary evidence. And at the most we talk about, oh, well, the intention of the author is to make, you know, the, the, this person look good or whatever. But is it really just about the personal idiosyncrasies of the author or the patron? Right, is, is there actually, isn't there an entire audience out there that is being spoken to that has to share a particular hermeneutic? And for me, what's I think a very kind of basic foundational thing is recovering what that hermeneutic is. What is the ground that they were speaking from, right? And because all too often um, scholars bring their ground uh, to bear in reading and interpreting the text. And that is a ground um, that has a very sordid colonial history. And so the, the, the kind of question I'm, I'm thinking about is what are our alternatives, right? What, what is the alternative by which we can approach these texts and access the ground? And the point isn't to say everybody love their brothers in perfect harmony, right? We know that's not true. Um, but the question is, what is significant about how they're talking about it, right? And how can it not just be some kind of story about, you know, just another story of um, dissolute and bloodthirsty, um, you know, oriental despots? What is the ethics at play? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a bit like sort of saying, well, you know, um, the the ultimate value of kind of this, this circle of justice doesn't mean that all these societies were just, right? But right. but that the the idea of the circle of justice, uh, with its bonds of of love and its hierarchy, was a very powerful one, um, and and that there was a broad consensus on that. So you know, it doesn't really matter in a sense what you know happened in all of these specific instances it still remained an important and valuable kind of um, uh, notion uh, and idea that people wanted to hold on to um, we have another question which again is is, is a bit on this um, although of course you i think you've kind of already answered it but um um Ozer ibrahim's asking whether you know this sort of social ethics is um is too limited to an elite you know i mean does it really go far beyond an elite? Um, what sort of evidence might we have actually in a, in say a 18th century or pre 18th century context for this actually permeating beyond an elite? Okay, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an important question. I mean, one of the things that I, I am thinking about in another uh, context, right? In the context of another chapter in the second book is thinking about, um, the kind of uh, the reach and the limits of what, what I might call the Persianate, right? And these sets of ideas. Um, and I don't think there's a kind of uh, firm set of boundaries around it. Um, but I think that looking trans regionally, even amongst elites, there is a bit of variation, right? And so when you're looking in terms of like social depth, um, there's bound to be variation as well. And we, obviously those things are more difficult to get at. Um, but I also think, um, and I did this to some degree in my first book, I, I think that what, what exactly do we mean by elite, right? Um, it, it seems one of the, the most, uh, it's like a panacea, <laughs> but it's so ill-defined. Um, and, and the fact is, is that at the end of the day, it's a relational term. Right, so elite according to what? Exactly. And what is the ground by which um, the question of the elite emerges? Um, and I think that there is a kind of very modern grounding of it, which is um, this idea of uh, the kind of, it, it's a very national idea of the masses as being the kind of authentic location of where things come from. And then, you know, the elite being a kind of artificial, um, crust on top. <laughs> and so the thing is, we don't actually know, um, we don't have any kind of sustained um, thinking on how culture works outside of that very modern 
um, set of conceptions, right? Um, I do think some of the scholarship on Europe that I've read, particularly Amy Hollywood's work, um, is very suggestive, um, which is, you know, in, in, in a kind of pre-Foucauldian context where um, the, the norm is not the average Joe um, with the 2.2 kids and the white picket fence. Before that, we're talking about a period of time in which what defines the norm is meant to be in a certain sense removed and unattainable, right? The norm is God and his friends. And that by definition doesn't include everybody. <laughs> Um, but but thinking about the circulation and transaction of it, I mean, I've been gathering a lot of different things, and there's evidence um, of the way in which some of the very, very basic um, stories, paradigms, ideas, um, uh, whether in stories or in verse, circulate. It's very clear it goes beyond those who are part of the community of people who compose texts. Um, it's very clear that it circulates much more deeply. It circulates in other languages, in adjacent languages. Um, and so thinking about that, um, and one really great example that I have is actually from uh, Gagan Sud's book, um, where he talks actually about a, a ceremony that takes place between merchants as being modeled on one that takes place in the royal court. Um, and it's to, to kind of bind trust and make a deal, right? Um, and, you know, but these are like, you know, finding references and needles in a haystack, right? Um, and actually with Samia Khatun, uh, she sent me uh, bits from her own research about the, the kind of use and circulation of Sadi's verses um, to prove and, and articulate certain kinds of um, moral points. Um, so I, I don't think, I, I don't know what the elite is, <laughs> but I don't think it's limited to just like the, the Sultan and his friends. Yeah, no, I think that that's fair enough. And, um, and yes, as you said, you know, the whole idea of the, the modern masses or even the public sphere is, has a particular kind of genealogy behind that. Um, I mean, this, the point um, about the circulation verse actually links quite nicely with Norman's earlier question, which was um, basically about the Ghazal. And to what extent the Ghazal is very much part of this effective sociability? Um, I mean, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've been collecting uh, are stories. Um, I mean, the Ghazal is the kind of premier form of poetry um, in, in, these, in these centuries, right? Um, and it also becomes the site of great contestation in terms of what its proper form is, both in Persian and in Urdu, right? Um, and, you know, it, it becomes incomprehensible why, why people were so invested in this question um, without, I think, this greater context in mind about what was at stake. Um, but the Ghazal is also both articulates it and becomes created in its process. Because one of the things that I think is important to think about is the, the social arenas that the Ghazal circulates within, right? It comes into being through particular relationships, right? Through the relationship of instruction, through sohbat with particular circles. One does not learn to read and write Ghazals or compose them uh, by oneself. They don't travel out of your hands in a book, right? Um, they are recited and circulated and, you know, not always successfully. Um, I have lots of stories and the, the biggest uh, uh, way that it's, um, there's a kind of archetype of the failed uh, Ghazal writer who takes, um, you know, what he's written and it's not met, it's either not met well by a small group or a large group and he goes and throws it in the hose in the pond. Um, and, you know, this is a, a kind of trope, but, but there is a, you know, and, and even if it's not an action, maybe you have a dream that somebody comes to you and says something to you, and then you wake up and you're able to compose, right? But it, it, it's completely dependent at every stage on people and on a community and a set of ties, but it also articulates the effective demeanor and what is transmit, what is supposed to be transmitted within it. 
yeah absolutely um in some ways it's kind of a good point maybe to stop on the ghazal um i can think of also interesting connections with the way in which uh, for example ali khan mahmud abad has this recent book on the the mushaira as a kind of an ethical space um and a i guess an alternative public space uh, in which literature is very much about the formation of the self you know and the cusp of new nationalisms and in south asia in particular um and we could certainly talk more about ghazals and, and sociability i'm sure um i but i think we should really let you go um uh, thank you for um, for taking the time to talk to us and um thank you for everyone who's been uh listening um uh, this video will of course be available on the facebook um page and um a recording will also be available on the institute of arab and islamic studies youtube channel um uh, it just uh, leads me to just quickly plug our next seminar so in two weeks we will have uh, elise uh, morgenstein first who will be talking about um uh, minor minoritization and um sort of the problem uh, of thinking about um uh, the muslim in in um in the period after 1857 in india uh, so please do join us uh, for that as well and we of course have our, our program up uh, for the rest of this term as well as we continue our, our set of conversations um focused very much on south asia but um thank you once again mana for taking this thank you <laughs> thanks for the conversation and uh, Well, look forward to to what um, comes out next, and and certainly the book um, on this. So thanks, uh, thank you once again. <laughs>